the two subjects are actually uh, both, they're closely allied. Um, there have been lots of great philosophers who were also great mathematicians, a couple of names that spring to mind, Pascal and Descartes. Um, lots of other philosophers who have been interested in mathematics and written a lot about maths, Plato, um, Wittgenstein, Kant, uh, for instance, all wrote a lot about the philosophy of mathematics. In the first year, first year of the course, there's, there's logic uh, paper, which all maths and philosophy students do, which is at the intersection of maths and philosophy. There's an introduction to the philosophy of mathematics, which connects the, the two subjects. And then in the third year, there's more philosophy of mathematics and there's logic as well. You have to do a combination of maths and philosophy, um, pretty much evenly split until the end of third year. So I wouldn't come expecting to drop one or the other very quickly, that's not going to happen. If you stay on for a fourth year, which you can, and quite a few students do, you have completely free choice. Um, it's, it's completely a la carte and you can do um, any mathematics options you like, any philosophy options uh, you like. I'd be prepared for a lot of very pure maths and a lot of very abstract thinking. There's, um, you do get the opportunity to do more applied maths, um, probability, calculus, and you actually, that's compulsory in first year. Basically it just makes all the maths you've learned at school seem quite trivial because you're suddenly just grasping at the concepts in a completely abstract way, so numbers barely come into it, basically. You have to be the kind of person who is happy talking about problems that don't have an immediately obvious application because that's going to be a, a constant throughout both the math and, and through the philosophy. I normally have somewhere between maybe five and eight lectures a week because sometimes philosophy lectures are given in different terms to when you're actually having tutorials on the paper, so the number goes up and down a little. I did a philosophy thesis, so I did a philosophy thesis on the um, philosophy of maths. I think that actually maths has really helped my philosophy. Um, so like, there's a surprising amount that I've been reading some paper in analytic philosophy, and they make this argument that really only a mathematician could understand. Um, so I'm very glad that I've, I've got a, math math, like, a sort of stronger mathematical background in doing philosophy. We have a fantastic college library, there's a philosophy library, there's um, the RSL which provides for maths books, um, there's the University Bodleian Library which has I think a copy of every book that's ever been published. Oxford is the largest philosophy department in the English speaking world which means that uh, any kind of philosophy that you're interested in there'll be someone here to talk to and in fact there won't just be someone, there'll be like half a dozen experts. It has the history you keep coming across, especially in philosophy, people who are doing books like down the road from where you're studying. Oxford has very able and very motivated and very interested and interesting students. Um, and being in the in, a, in in this group and with lots of other motivated students, I think is a great student experience. The main resource is probably just people, the tutors who you get to have and the other students you get to contact with, and also all the speakers that come to the university. The tutorial system was something which I'd never really been exposed to before and it can be a bit intimidating because obviously you're talking to some, you know, a world expert in your, in your area. But at the same time the tutorials are really enriching. So if you've struggled with work, as most people do at some stage, um, once you get to your tutorial you usually understand things afterwards and also particularly in philosophy you'll be left with a lot of new questions and new directions to think about things which are quite fruitful. I think the thing to bear in mind with tutorials that is like, less obvious is that they're, they're as flexible as you want them to be. And tutors, and it, it took me a while to get comfortable with saying, actually, I don't understand the explanation you've just given me. Can, can we go through that again? The whole standard of work expected of you is much higher. People will expect you to be you know, giving a con some contribution with what you do, as opposed to just being kind of passively receiving knowledge. The typical workload uh, for the two subjects, for maths and philosophy, would be maybe eight to nine uh, problems, an, ex a single, an exercise sheet for, for maths, and perhaps a 1,500 to 2,000 word essay per week for philosophy. Everyone has sort of a bit of an idea of an essay where you do some reading, you figure out what you're going to say, and then you write it. But a problem sheet is a sheet of A4 paper with maybe 
nine problems at most. And it took me quite a long time to get my head around the fact that this isn't something you can do in an hour or an hour and a half. It requires as much effort as an essay does and you need to timetable as much for it. If you're writing a philosophy essay, it's a bit more like doing a maths, uh, maths problem than writing a, literary, a literature essay. There are a lot of myths going on about Oxford, about how Oxford is you know, stuffy or pretentious. Or The other thought I had was, was that everyone was going to be insanely clever and that I would never be able to keep up. But that's not the case. People are basically quite normal in the sense that they have other interests. You know, Some people are really into sports or drama or music and people enjoy making friends and socialising. So I think that's something I would, I would have liked to know was sort of um, how active life is at Oxford. We are looking for applicants who are very thoughtful. Um, in maths, for instance, we're looking for applicants who know how to use the techniques, but more importantly, know why the techniques work. Um, in philosophy, we're looking for students who can think through a problem, who are able to stand back and say, hang on, what is going, here, going on here? How do I tackle this problem? The way to, that I found helpful to think about, in, about interviews is that they're mock tutorials, because I got a lot of advice that was very good advice for a job interview, but actually an Oxford interview is not a job interview. They're not looking for you to be a great person or to be really flashy. They're looking for somebody who's keen on their subject and will, in a tutorial, learn and be able to like, interact in a, in a helpful way. The main virtue that I look for in uh, candidates at the interview is open-mindedness. I think it's important for candidates to, uh, to think. Um, speed is certainly not of the essence. The important thing is to absorb the question, think about it, reflect, ponder it, and come up with, with an answer. A lot of interviews will just take the form of a tutor into introducing you to something that you've not seen before and seeing how you cope with it. So take them as an exciting opportunity to learn something from somebody who's at the top of their field, rather than a grilling in which if you make the slightest mistake, you'll be sent down to the dungeons. If you've thought through it enough and decided that that's really what you want to do, you'll be able to go to the interview and demonstrate that you really love the topic. Do some reading. You don't have to know very much philosophy before coming up to, to interview or before applying to Oxford to read mathematics and philosophy. Um, but it is helpful to know what the subject is like and to have done some reading. I was just, you know, checking my email in the morning um, and it just said St. Hughes College decision. <laughs> and it was a really it was a really stressful moment because I just knew that, you know, whatever whatever was the decision, it was going to be something definite that would change my life. Um, so I think I just walked around the house for a bit before opening it. And then I just read the first sentence and I think I just went a bit crazy for the moment. I was so, so happy. Math and philosophy gives you highly transferable skills. Um, I'd consider academia, but ask me again in a year. Um, potentially a law conversion course um, and potentially something completely different. Our students do all sorts of things after graduating. They become lawyers or they become um, programmers or they might work in IT, they might become teachers. I've had some students who um, work in think tanks, um, other students go into postgraduate uh, research. There's really all sorts of things one can do after maths and philosophy. I think I would quite like to stay in research because I really enjoy learning and thinking about um, abstract issues. I'm not sure of exactly what area I would like to do research in. I'm, I'm quite interested in questions about the mind but also in questions about ethics. My advice is very simple. Set aside any tactical reasons for choosing a degree course and just simply apply for the course you're most interested in.